Good evening and welcome to our 35th annual Henninger Lecture at the University of Scranton. I'm Jordan Petras, the Chair of the Department of Economics and Finance. It's a great pleasure and privilege for the University of Scranton to be able to welcome Dr. Yuli Sanikov, the Jack Steele Parker Professor of Economics from Stanford School, Graduate School of Business. Before we introduce our speaker today, I would like to acknowledge the Robert Sackenbach Foundation for the continuous generous financial support without which this event would not be possible. Also, I would like to recognize the dedicated team of faculty and staff in my department, as well as our Omicron Delta Epsilon Honor Society, whose commitment continues to ensure a successful Henry George event. Thank you all for your hard work and commitment. <coughs> our Henry George Lecture Series continues the tradition of attracting excellent speakers. Several of our past speakers have received the Nobel Prize in Economics shortly after they deliver uh, the speech here at the University of Scranton. About one third of our past Henry Lecture speakers have received the Nobel Prize in Economics. This year's Nobel Prize in Economics was awarded to three economists. David, uh, one half was awarded to David Card uh, from UC Berkeley, and uh, he was our 31st annual Henry George Lecture speaker in 2016, and the other half was awarded to Joshua Angris from MIT and uh, Guido Ibens from Stanford a graduate school of business. We hope this tradition continues. No pressure, uh, Professor Sanikov. <laughs> On behalf of the Department of Economics and Finance, the Arthur J. Kanye School of Management, and the University of Scranton community, Professor Sanikov, thank you for joining us this evening. You have all the opportunity to ask questions at the end of our uh, uh, lecture. Uh, there will be microphones on both sides, uh, so you can just raise your hand. At this point, I would like to invite my colleague, Dr. John Calagnotis, Professor of Finance, to formally introduce our speaker this evening. Good evening. I would like to take my mask because you cannot hear anything. Ladies and gentlemen and students, I'm John Calagnotis, and I'm a professor of finance at the Economics and Finance Department. I am so pleased tonight to present to you our guest figure, who is here, uh, Dr. Yulis Anikov. This was an honor for me, and they asked me last week if I can do this, and it is my pleasure. Uh, a small bio for the Dr. Sanikov. Yuli Sanikov is the Jack Steele Parker Professor of Economics at Stanford University at the Graduate School of Business. His research has contributed significantly to the study of dynamic games, applications that exist today in design of securities, contract, theories of contract, microeconomics, financial frictions, and also micro uh, uh, structures, and many other collusion and many other than research. His most recent work also is a complex model in finance and macroeconomics. For her, Sanikov was awarded also with the John Bate Clark Medal in 2016. This medal is awarded annually to the most successful American young professors that they have at an age less than 40 years old. And of course, uh, Dr. Sanikov received this award. Also, he has received an award, the Fisher Black Prize in 2015, a year earlier. And also, he has received a Kiel Ex Excellence Award in global economic affairs, and this goes even earlier, in 2014. Dr. Sanikov have written many articles in top journals, like Econometrica, the American Economic Review, Macroeconomics, the Journal of Finance, the Review of Economics and Studies, and also then in many other journals in economics and finance. Professor Sanikol also received a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Princeton University in 2000, and a PhD in business administration from the Stanford University at the Graduate School of Business in 2004. 
He was a professor of economics at Princeton University from 2008 to 2016, and after that then at Stanford University. Dr. Sanifko will speak tonight with the talks that we see on the, on the screen, the value of money, currencies, bonds, and bitcoins. Without further delays, please join me in welcoming Dr. Yuli Sanikov. OK. So uh, thank you, John, for this great introduction. And uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, and uh, taking time out of your evenings uh, to come here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in Scranton. So um, in this title, there is uh, money, bonds, and uh, Bitcoin. And uh, so um, many of you may have been wondering about uh, Bitcoin, and I have been wondering also, is it uh, money or is it a bubble? OK, so that's... Uh, that's a, a big question. And um, I'm going to give a bit of an introduction and then give you uh, an outline for, for this talk. So here's the price of Bitcoin over the past uh, five years. Um, and you see that uh, there is a, a big rise in value, but also huge volatility. Um, and uh, there are people who say things for Bitcoin, and then there are people who say things uh, uh, against Bitcoin. And uh, proponents of Bitcoin, they say things like, well, um, the total supply of coin is limited. So, so that means that um, unlike, uh, for example, US dollars controlled by the uh, US government, um, the money supply is regulated by an authority that it can increase. The supply for Bitcoin, the total supply is fixed and can be at most uh, 21 uh, million Bitcoin that can be mined altogether. So also uh, people say that, well, with Bitcoin, it's a distributed ledger, so there's no faith in the central authority that's required. Um, and uh, transactions cannot be censored. Um, and Bitcoin cannot be seized. So you can you know, hold the Bitcoin and it's a distributed ledger. So um, unless, um, you, uh, unless you change the whole ledger, you cannot uh, uh, seize somebody Bitcoin. So people uh, make these things for Bitcoin. But on the other hand, uh, you know, the arguments again, there is uh, the price volatility. There is the uncertainty about regulation. What if the government makes Bitcoin illegal? There is uh, something you might have heard of, the scalability problem. So the scalability problem is the fact that transactions in Bitcoin are actually quite computationally intensive. Uh, so there is, uh, so Bitcoin, the, uh, uh, the native sort of like way of doing transactions in Bitcoin cannot compete with the uh, Visa network, for example. But, uh, you can build layers on top of the, the, the basic uh, uh, framework and uh, you, know, you can build payments on top of it, so that's okay. Then there is the big question that, well, is Bitcoin backed by anything and it's backed by nothing, right? So that's, that's, that's potentially a problem, whereas the dollar is backed by all of the wealth of uh, the United States. Um, and, uh, and then one biggest concern is, you know, why Bitcoin is the one. There are other uh, cryptocurrencies. There is Dogecoin that uh, Elon Musk is tweeting about. There is, I've heard today about Scranton coin. And, uh, uh, and then uh, there is uh, Ethereum. So uh, all of those. So uh, something that I decided to try for, for this talk is um, uh, I have a... a small number of questions, and I think it would be fun to, to do a survey. So that this, the way that the survey works, if you want to participate, it's completely anonymous, is you go to this uh, website on your phone called slido.com, and importantly, you should enter this number. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to activate, I have to activate the survey in order for you to be able to participate in it. And the first question is a simple question, but later on you'll have some more challenging questions. The first question is, um, do you hold Bitcoin or other cryptocurrency? 
And you'll see that if you answer this question, then right away you see the poll results for people in this room and they're updated in real time. So that's going to be fun and I'm going to uh, give a little bit of a, of a time for you to answer. Okay, so um, going once, going twice, going three times, and I'm going to uh, stop the poll, and uh, you, you, you can see the answers on your devices, but about one third of this room um, have Bitcoin, and, uh, um, and then uh, two thirds, they don't have Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is very, uh, widespread. Okay. Um, I'm going to reset the results uh, so that I can use this for, for another poll. Okay. So that's, that's uh, interesting. So some people may hold Bitcoin because of uh, uh, concern for inflation, for example. And inflation is uh, something that, that's been happening in the U.S. a little bit uh, recently. Um, so um, the U.S. has had... Um, uh, very stable rate of inflation of about uh, 2% for the last uh, 10 years, yeah, even more so. And then uh, you can see on the slide on the top graph, this is the uh, graph for inflation. There has been, uh, inflation has lowered a little bit during the pandemic and recently there has been uh, uptick in inflation and the most recent data from October gives a number of 6.2%, uh, which is a lot bigger than um, uh, recently, and in the past, U.S. has experienced inflation in the 1970s, and other countries uh, have experienced, you know, various periods of inflation at various times, and uh, at some parts of the world, there, have, there has been hyperinflation, so it's important to be aware of uh, all of those things, okay? And uh, uh, there is a potentially a link between um, uh, inflation rate and uh, uh, government spending and government budget, okay? So probably for the recent rise in, in inflation, that's probably not the case because uh, it's more of a temporary phenomenon, you know, most likely because people are coming uh, from the pandemic. But um, here is uh, some data that points to it. So. Uh, this is the uh, government spending, and this is 2020, so it has uh, risen sharply. And this is the uh, net uh, deficit, okay? So there has been uh, a huge uh, budget deficit in the 2020. And it's interesting that um, it's not obviously perfect alignment because uh, the increase in spending is somewhere around here, but the increase in, in, in inflation is somewhere, you know, a little bit later. Um, so, but nevertheless, fundamentally, at least in the long run, um, the value of currency uh, should have something to do with uh, uh, how the government balances uh, its budgets. Um, and uh, one big question is actually, is it possible for the government um, to have debt and to be running a budget deficit forever, or is it not possible. So that's one of the uh, interesting questions. So how do economists think about money? So money is, um, has three roles. So typically in the uh, in introductory class, if there is a lecture on money, uh, people say that, well, money is a store of value, money is a unit of account, and money is a medium of exchange. Okay, and historically, money has been uh, backed by gold, and gold has been used as money at various points in history, then uh, the Bretton Woods system tied major currencies in the world to gold, uh, but you know, that system has been abandoned a long time ago, and ultimately what is government money backed by? It's backed by the uh, uh, faith in the government, it's backed by the uh, tax revenues. 
okay? So for that reason, ultimately, the government budget is important, but could the government be re really be running uh, deficits? And the, if the government is running deficits, then if you actually value money as government's obligations, then those deficits will be negative cash flows in the future, and it's a question, well, can an asset with negative cash flows have positive value? So with this uh, uh, introduction, let me give you the plan for this uh, lecture. So I'm going to start by talking about uh, valuation according to textbook. So um, I have spoken with some of the students and uh, here, and um, uh, there are classes you know, on valuation that uh, many of you are uh, taking. So I'm going to start by talking about valuation according to textbook. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what enters the valuation formula and why do we have uh, the different uh, numbers in the valuation formula, where they come from. What's the philosophy behind uh, finding the value of an asset? Okay, and then um, I'm going to see how this applies to assets with uh, negative cash flow. So I'm going to try to go a little bit beyond textbook and talk about the economics to try to understand the uh, bubbles, money, and government debt. Okay, and something that I really wanted to, to do for this talk is, uh, so typically when you talk to somebody about Bitcoin, somebody knowledgeable, then they'll tell you about blockchain, they'll tell you about the hash function, they'll tell you about you know, all of the technology that goes behind it, how payments work. And for this talk, what I wanted to do is I wanted to not talk any of that, but instead to talk about the, the economics. Why economically something like Bitcoin could have value and is it rational or is it you know, uh, irrational exuberance, you know, pure bubble, that's, that's the question. So I don't want to talk about technology, and I want to talk more about, um, a, again, the fundamental value and not uh, speculation, not uh, market fluctuations. Okay? So uh, market fluctuations is something that is uh, difficult to explain uh, from the point of view of economics, but uh, fundamental value, well, is there any fundamental value in an asset that has uh, zero or negative cash flows, and why? So, but I'm going to start with this uh, fundamental valuation equation. The value of an asset is the present value of the future cash flows that the asset generates. So, for example, if it's a, a share of a company, then the cash flows could be future dividends that you receive on the stock. Or depending on how you value the company, well, maybe you're doing discounted cash flows and those are free cash flows or cash flows to, to equity. So, okay, so those are cash flows. For the bond, well, you receive uh, coupon payments on the bond, and you receive the principal later on. And then investors, they prefer to have money now rather than money later on, and so you need to use a discount rate to take into account the time value of money. So there is a discount rate in there. Okay, um, and in the class, on on valuation, I'm sure you go into all of the nitty-gritty details about how to do it, for, but for this talk, I can uh, um, use this uh, simpler version of a valuation formula that applies for assets which have a constant growth rate. So this formula only applies for, for example, for mature companies that have uh, you know, very steady growth, and I'm going to uh, use this formula to value a particular mature company in a, in a moment, just to give an example of how this formula works. Okay? Um, and after we get a little bit comfortable with this formula, then um, I want to ask the question, what, what about negative cash flows? Okay? Why would an asset, and how can we sort of like relate this formula to assets without cash flows? Okay. So, to start with an example, I'm going to value the legendary American company of Coca-Cola, okay? Um, and if you go to online, and if you, um, so, uh, Google Coca-Cola investor relations, you have uh, all of the information about 
the past dividends that Coca-Cola has been paying, okay? And uh, in the past year, the dividend has been 42 cents a share. And uh, 10 years ago, the dividend was, uh, uh, so there was a stock split, but adjusted for, for the stock split, the dividend was uh, 23 and a half cents a share, uh, 23 and a half cents for what is one share today. So it was actually you know, tw twice as big, uh, um, and then uh, one share back then split into two shares, but the bottom line is the right number we have to use is 23.5 uh, cents. And then 10 years before, it was nine cents. Uh, 10 years before that, it was uh, three cents. And you can find that the annual growth was 6% over the last 10 years, 10% over 10 years before that, and 11% percent uh, over 10 years before that. And um, this, is, this is spectacular. And it's also spectacular because um, uh, the company hasn't cut dividends in a long, long time. Okay, so, uh, so, so that's, that's, that's the thing. And um, so now how to, how to value a share of Coca-Cola. So this is an example which, so we have a very simple formula here, and uh, it fits as close as you can hope, okay? And uh, um, let me explain what you would put into this formula. So for the uh, cash flow, what you want to put is you want to put the total dividend that you receive from a share of Coca-Cola for the coming year. And by the way, if you're doing this in practice, then what you would typically do is you would uh, use more detailed information about the company and do uh, free cash flow evaluation rather than the dividend discount model that I'm doing right here. But this is, uh, um, you know, this is, this is quicker, okay? So um, for the cash flow, you would put uh, 42 cents, but it's received four times because this is quarterly dividend and you would multiply it by one plus G, one plus the gross. So that would, would, that's what you would use for the cash flow. And then we have to decide what to use for the discount rate, and we have to decide what to use for gross, okay? So for gross, what, what to use is that, well, this growth rate is spectacular. Um, do we expect this growth rate of 6% to go on forever? And uh, what we should do here, really, what we should use for growth is uh, our expectation of the growth of the company going forward, right? So uh, past numbers will give us some guidance, but ultimately what you want is uh, to look into the future and go the, and look at the expected future growth. And here um, it's useful to um, use the um, growth rate of GDP as a, as a benchmark, uh, because no company can grow, grow in the long run faster than the GDP of, of the, um, I guess, of the world in this case, because it's a, it's a global company, but let's use uh, the GDP growth rate of the US, okay? So um, does anybody know what's the growth rate of GDP? Anybody? So you can, you can look it up, and you know, if, if you're curious, you can actually look up the whole data on GDP. If you Google um, like St. Louis Fed um, GDP data, and then St. Louis Bed, Fed has uh, uh, all of the GDP data publicly available. It's very easy to pull down, and you can like look at the numbers yourself. And it's actually much nicer if you look at the numbers yourself rather than you know you listen to a professor tell you about it, right? Um, and you'll find that over the past 10 years, uh, the nominal growth rate was uh, 4%, and the real growth rate was about uh, 2%. So there was 2% inflation, and that's why the, the, the difference. So I'm going to use uh, the nominal growth rate because I'm also going to use the nominal discount rate, okay? And then for the discount rate, um, I'll uh, uh, tell you a little bit about uh, how to estimate it, but but basically, the discount rate is just the risk-free rate plus, because it's a risky investment, so any stock is a risky investment, there has to be a risk premium. 
and so uh, here's, a, here's our exercise for uh, valuation. Um, so let's use the growth rate of 3%, which is just a little bit lower than the GDP growth rate, because I cannot use 6% because this is higher than GDP growth rate. So it's, you know, it's spectacular, but in the future, it cannot outgrow the GDP. And uh, I use a little bit less than GDP because this is a spectacular company, but you know, any spectacular company in a thousand years you know, might not be uh, there, so okay. Um, and then for the discount rate, 2% um, is the 30-year uh, treasury rate. And uh, let's use the risk premium of 4%, so assuming market risk premium of 6% and beta, you can look it up, 0 0.66, that's the risk premium. So if you, if you put this into the formula and if you do the calculation, you get the price of uh, uh, 57 dollars and 68 cents. And this is a very good estimate of a share price because if you look it up where it was trading uh, this morning, it was you know, maybe 55 dollars and 80 cents. So this is, this is very, very close, okay? So this is, uh, it's always nice, you know, when you have an abstract formula to put in some real numbers and to see how it gives a reasonable uh, solution, okay? So, um, now, um, if you want to apply this to um, assets which are um, like assets with uh, uh, negative cash flows, then you want to understand very deeply what we put into this formula and why, okay? And uh, in this formula, we have uh, the future cash flows, we have the discount rate, and we have an estimate of the growth of cash flows. Um, and what we put in this formula is we put two types of information. We put the information about uh, the asset itself, and then we put some macro information about the market conditions, okay? And the information about the asset itself is the information about the cash flows that the asset will generate and uh, the growth rate of those cash flows. Although even here, macro matters because the company doesn't exist in vacuum, and we have to look at the macro in order to estimate, uh, given, make an estimate of the growth rate of, of these cash flows, okay? And then the discount rate, well, this is ultimately coming from the market, okay? And uh, uh, the, the discount rate is, well, what are the current interest rates, which depend on the market condition? What is current appetite for the risk of the market? how does the market currently perceive the risk of a particular company, okay? So that's the, the market, okay? Um, and in the valuation class, um, so I have this slide and I'm going to go through this uh, very briefly, like what uh, uh, I tell students, for example, in the valuation class, because I was teaching a corporate finance class at Princeton before, is so um, these points, you probably have heard about them before, but for this talk, only really the last point is important because I'm going to carry that last point to talking about uh, Bitcoin. So um, I, I tell students to be consistent in the units, real versus nominal. So um, R and G should be both uh, nominal or both real because you cannot mix apples and oranges together. Um, that uh, the discount rate that we use should be higher for riskier assets and lower for safer assets because investors require compensation for risk. And how to measure risk? Well, for, we can measure risk, for example, using CAPM um, because we want to measure uh, market risk as opposed to diversifiable risk. So if investors can diversify, then they should really care about the common risk they can, that cannot be diversified away. Um, your company can grow faster than GDP in the short run, but not over the long run, because over the long run, your company cannot outgrow uh, the whole economy. And the last point is um, that there is a lot of uncertainty, okay? So some of the things are very difficult to measure. 
And one of the basic inputs of valuation that is, in fact, very difficult to measure is the risk premium. So the difference between the risk-free rate and uh, the required rate and of return on, on the whole stock market. Uh, so people typically measure it by looking at uh, the past stock returns, for example, over the past uh, 50 years. Okay? And this is something you could readily pull out uh, from the internet if you wanted to compute it uh, on your own. Um, for example, you can Google Aswath Damodaran, who is a, a valuation guru at NYU, and he has, you know, his webpage is, is amazing. He has a lot of, you know, really good data and really, so if you're interested in valuation, you should, you should, you know, go, go and see. I have personally learned a lot from, from his uh, uh, webpage. So you can get the data, for example, from him, and uh, if you um, use the last 50 years of uh, stock returns, you get an estimate of the risk premium of 7.67%. And this is what you typically see in the finance class. But now, of course, this is a statistical estimate. And whenever we have statistic, then statistics, then we also have a confidence interval, right? So the question is, well, if you compute the confidence interval for that estimate, how big is it going to be? You use 50 years of data, so you use a lot of data, and you probably would guess that the confidence interval is, you know, should be pretty small, so this should be a pretty precise estimate. So here is the 95% confidence interval. It's 3% uh, until 12%, okay? So now it's like, wait a minute, <laughs> okay? You use, uh, we use 50 years of data. We take a huge leap of faith that, uh, this data from the past is going to be somehow still relevant and still reflective of the future. And, uh, but by taking that leap of faith, we collect a lot of data. And after collecting a lot of data and hoping for a precise estimate, this is our confidence interval, okay? So uh, it's pretty, pretty bad. So there is a lot of uncertainty. And because there is a lot of uncertainty, uh, you know, if, uh, if, if you think that people who are investing in Bitcoin are wrong, it's like, hey, you know, how can you tell that they're wrong, okay? So even if, uh, right. So, okay. So now let me come back to this valuation formula. And sort of like, if you just take a look at it mathematically, okay, so in the numerator, it's cash flow. In the denominator, it's a discount rate minus the growth rate. So suppose uh, cash flows are negative. So it's an asset that uh, uh, pays negative cash flows in the future, okay? So, uh, well, if you discount them, you should get a negative value, right? Uh, unless, of course, somehow the denominator ends up being negative also, which means that the growth rate is going to be higher than the discount rate, right? So, but that's, that's like totally crazy because mathematically it makes sense, but like economically, why would it make sense? So it's like, okay. So um, there are hints in there about these assets with negative cash flows, but we really need to, need to think about it deeply. And we need to think about, well, what is ultimately the logic behind this formula? Because from the textbook, we kind of just like learn it and we learn how to apply it, but like, why, why is the formula, why, why should it be true? So um, that's, that's, the, that's the real question we should ask. So ultimately, what we have to start with is, uh, so what's one of the most fundamental principles in economics? In any, in any economics, you know, finance, is uh, supply equals demand, right? So this is something you always learn in the basic economics class. You know, it draws the supply curve, draw the demand curve, and supply equals demand. Okay. Why supply equals demand is because if there is um, too much demand relative to supply, then, well, price will eventually have to adjust and will have to go up until supply equals demand. Okay. So supply equals demand, then people say, well, then the market is in equilibrium, and that determines the price. 
And, and so this principle also has to apply to financial markets as well. Okay, so it applies to the market for oil, right? The, look at the demand for oil and look at you know, the oil producers. It applies to the housing market. So if you want to ask, well, what is the price of a particular house in the street is, well, you're not going to look at the cash flows from this house, although you, know, you could look at the rental income. You could. But uh, you could also look at, well, on this street, um, are the houses on the street, how much uh, were they uh, selling for? And, uh, um, and what is the size of this house? And how nice is it relative to other houses in the street? And then this will tell us something about um, the, the price. Okay? But the way that it works in finance is that um, ultimately investors care about the cash flows that an asset will potentially uh, generate, right? Um, or actually let me say it slightly different. Investors care about return. That's, that's even, even better to say. Investors care about how much money they can buy the asset for and what they can sell it for in the future. Okay? And uh, for, the for, the, for the buyer later, if they can sell it or not, that's their problem. Okay? So, um, and whatever they can, they can get from this asset, this is the actual expected return uh, from this asset. And financial market is in equilibrium if the required return equals the actual expected return. And what is the required return is, well, you're trying to invest in this, well, a startup in Silicon Valley, right? And, uh, well, um, what else you can invest in? So you look at the other investment opportunities, is this more attractive or is this not attractive? And, uh, um, and uh, there is a certain required return that you want to earn on your money given the risk that you have. Um, and ultimately, the required return is the, the demand side. So it depends on the asset risk. It depends on investor preferences. It depends on other investment opportunities. So ultimately, the required rate of return reflects the current market conditions. Is this a, a good market right now, or is this uh, not a good market right now? It reflects the current uh, investment conditions. And valuation is... Uh, a science through which we figure out what is the required rate of return on any asset, okay? Uh, and uh, so when we, when we compute that required return, that's the most important input to the valuation, okay? Um, you look at the current market conditions. You put it in, and then uh, we get information the, about the future cash flows and we find the price that investors should be willing to pay for this asset so that the required rate of return that they require for investing in this asset equals the actual um, expected return on the asset. So when figuring out this required rate of return, we look at the other assets in the market, so ultimately all valuation is relative. Okay? So... Um, Now, um, let me ask the, a, a couple of uh, questions about um, actual return, and uh, then I will uh, tie this back together, and then you'll talk about cash flows with negative value. So I'm going to launch this uh, survey one more time. Let's see. I think I should reset results. Let me try launching it. Yes, okay. So now it's running. So uh, the number... Uh, if you don't remember, it's uh, 353824, although I think your devices will probably remember the number. So the first question is, true or false, return on any asset cannot exceed the GDP growth rate. And the three possible answers is always true over any horizon, always true in the long run, and maybe false even in the long run. Okay. So, um, going once, 
going twice. Last chance. Okay, let me stop the poll. Um, and most of the people have answered B, but I'll tell you in a moment what is the true answer. But before that, I'll ask another question. Okay? Also true or false, and let me reset this poll. Okay. Uh, now, uh, this, is the, this is the third question that we are doing, uh, it, and it's, it's almost the same question, but then it says, return on any asset with uh, uh, zero cash flows cannot exceed the GDP growth rate. So the difference is that the number two is return on any asset with positively positive cash flows. Number three is return on any asset with zero cash flows. Okay, and uh, going once, going twice, okay, and let me stop the poll. Okay, and you can, I'm not sure if you can still see the results, but most people have answered A, okay? So, uh, most of the, uh, so, um, um, so let me, let me, uh, let me explain what the right answers are here. So, uh, so you're right that um, the return on the assets which, uh, which have cash flows could potentially be higher than the return of the assets with zero cash flow. So that's, that's absolutely right. And the, the true answer is, um, um, sorry, I was talking. Let me make sure I get this right myself. <laughs> um, The true answers are, uh, I believe, C and B, and let me explain why, why this is the case, sorry. <laughs> okay, the true answer is, uh, is C and B. Okay, so let me explain why this is the case. So, um, why is it that the return on any asset can exceed, so maybe false even in the long run. So, so maybe, maybe the statement wasn't completely clear, but let me clarify the statement. So here the statement says that if you take an asset with cash flows, its return could exceed the GDP growth rate, right? Okay, so why, why, why it's possible for it to exceed the GDP growth rate? Because the return has two components. It has dividends, the cash flows that you're receiving, plus appreciation. So the appreciation in the long run cannot exceed the, the GDP because growth cannot out, uh, uh, out, an asset cannot outgrow the economy. But you could get extra return through the cash flows. So therefore, the, the return typically would, uh, would exceed the GDP growth rate. That's how we, we typically think about the assets. So uh, this statement may be false even in the long run. In fact, it's usually false in the, in, in the long run, right? Um, and for this question, return on any assets with zero cash flows cannot exceed the GDP growth, is that, well, this return on the asset with zero cash flows could exceed over the short run. For example, Bitcoin, right? The price could suddenly double over one day, and then the return obviously exceeds the GDP growth rate. However, over the long run, um, it cannot outgrow the GDP, right? So there is an upper bound. It cannot outgrow the, the whole economy. And so this is always true in the, in the long run. So here the correct answer is B. Okay. So, um, so one more time, the correct answers are uh, C and, and B. Okay. So, um, but the bottom line is, um, let me say this very clearly, that for an asset with zero cash flows, um, its actual return 
over the short run, well, you could speculate in it and you could make a, a huge return over the short run. But if you are a buy and hold investor and you invest for the long run, the growth rate cannot exceed the GDP growth rate, the actual growth rate on the actual uh, return on Bitcoin, because Bitcoin doesn't generate any cash flows, cannot exceed the GDP growth rate. And then the relevant question to ask is that, well, is this enough to satisfy the investor's required return? Okay. And uh, here is a theorem which you just proved. And the theorem says that any asset with zero cash flows can have positive value only if required return is less than or equal than GDP growth rate in the long run. Okay? Because why, why, why this is true? Why? So the proof is that uh, in the long run, the actual return has to be less than the GDP growth rate because there are no cash flows, so it cannot exceed the growth rate of GDP. Value cannot outgrow the GDP. Um, if value is positive, then the market has to be in equilibrium. So required return has to equal to the actual return. Otherwise, people would not want to buy it. And therefore, required return has to be less than the GDP growth rate. But apart from this, let me explain this in simple language. So the return cannot exceed the GDP growth rate. And therefore, uh, for the asset to have value, it has to be the case that people are, are willing to, to buy it, to invest, even if um, a rate of return less than the GDP growth rate is satisfactory. So then, even though there are no cash flows, at least the value could grow with the GDP, and that could be an acceptable return. Okay. So, um, right. Um, so, okay. So, so then the, the key question we have to answer in order to determine when assets with zero cash flows can have value is the question, uh, well, about the required return. And uh, here there are uh, two perspectives we can take. So first, how people actually uh, estimate required return in practice in the course is that there is a whole mechanical procedure how to get the required return from the market. Is first step, you get the current risk-free rate. Second step, you figure out what is the risk premium or the market appetite for risk. And third is uh, you use some type of a um, model to determine uh, the required risk premium for the asset, for example, CAPEX. And if you took a valuation class, there is a whole mechanical way of doing it. Um, however, fundamentally, what does required return depend on? And uh, this is a very, very difficult question. So what are the macroeconomic variables that would make uh, a return, a long run return on Bitcoin of uh, a real return, real GDP growth of 2% acceptable for investors? Is it, is it an acceptable return, a real return of uh, 2%? What does it depend on? Well, of course, it depends on the, how much the whole market for, for investments and the various opportunities that people have. And in order to understand the forces that fundamentally determine this supply and demand relationship, that determine the required return, we have to look at, uh, you know, the, the whole world is complicated. And because the whole world is so complicated, we have to, what the economists do in that case is they write a very simple model in order to understand something complex. So we have to look at a very simple model. And what I'm going to do next is I'm going to show a very simple model in which it will be clear what determines the required return on investment. And that simple model is going to be, uh, it's called the OLG model, the overlapping generations model, of the economist uh, Paul Samuelson, who um, got the Nobel Prize in economics in 1970. So he was uh, an economist at MIT, a colleague, uh, and I think a contemporary, uh, Robert Solo, and I think Solo gave a, uh, gave a talk here um, uh, many years ago. Uh, so Samuelson was, was his colleague, and he wrote this model. And for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to modify it slightly, so it's not going to be the exact Samuelson model. But I'm going to make it very, 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 uh, you know, uh, hopefully easy, easy to absorb. And also, from, from this model, we'll be able to uh, do some important takeaways. So the model is actually 
this is going to be very, very simple. Um, so there are many, many periods, okay? Time periods, period zero, period one, period two, and so on and so forth. And uh, in each time period, there is a generation of people who are born in that period. And they're going to live for two periods. So somebody born in period 10 is going to live and be young in period 10, and they're going to live and be old in period 11, okay? Um, and uh, they live for two periods. And uh, some people will be born in period 11, and they'll be old in period 12. So that's why it's called overlapping generations, okay? And uh, the way that it works is uh, only young people have some production in this economy. So a young person is going to go to the forest, so they all live. Uh, each period, a thousand people are born. And they all go to this forest near the place where they live, and they go pick apples. And then they can eat those apples. And uh, every single person picks a thousand apples, and they can eat those apples when they're young, or they can store them and eat them during old age. And, but there is a catch, that if they store them, then half of the apples spoil. Okay. So that's how it works in this model. For example, very, very simple, right? So, um, for example, somebody could pick 1,000 apples and decide to eat 400 when uh, that person is young, then uh, uh, store 600, and then half of them spoil, so 300 is left, so they eat 300 when they're old. And altogether, 400 plus uh, 300, they eat uh, 700 in this particular example. Okay? So, um, uh, so that's, that's how it works in this model, and then I'm going to, to, to change it a little bit. So, of course, uh, how many apples people can store? Well, it's their personal decision, right? So let me ask this question, and it's a, it's a multiple choice question, and it's the question of, um, I'm going to reset the results. Okay, it's the question is, what are R and G in this model? So remember, R is the required rate of return on investments. Um, and it comes from looking at the whole market, what's available to people. And uh, G is the, the growth rate of the economy. Okay, so I see 195 people, 200 have voted. So I'm about to close the poll. So uh, going once, going twice, last chance. Okay, and you know, perhaps I, I don't close the poll so that you, you can see the, the numbers, but the poll has officially ended. And so you see that most of you have answered C, okay? Uh, and C is the right answer, so congratulations. So you're really good at solving uh, Samuelson's overlapping generations model, okay? So uh, why, why this is the case? Well, G is zero, okay? So of course I could change the model to, to make a more realistic G, you know, have some population growth that people add to this model. But in this particular case, G is zero because there is the same number of people that are born in every single period, and the whole GDP is a thousand people times a thousand apples, so it's a million apples. That's the GDP in every sing single period, okay? And it's not growing, so the growth rate is zero. And what is the return on investment that people have, and what is gonna be the required return on in any investment? So half of the apples spoil, that's a fact of life in this economy, 
And so R is um, minus 50%, okay? So um, it's, so it, it's a little bit strange because normally, you know, when we talk about the rates of return, we're not talking about minus 50%. But, uh, you know, this is an extreme example just to, to make some points here. So it's minus 50%, okay? And so um, G is zero, and R is uh, minus 50%. Um, and so this suggests that maybe in this world, with G greater than R, there is a room for, for an asset with zero cash flows to have values. We'll see that in a moment. But this situation with R less than G, economists, they call it dynamic inefficiency. Okay. So that's the term that economists use. Uh, and dynamic inefficiency, it arises because of uh, frictions. Okay. Here, in this case, inadequate supply of investable assets. That's, uh, that's the friction because people want to, instead of just storing their apples, they want to invest their apples in something and get some growth, right? And why is it dynamic inefficient here? It's because, well, um, you could do better in this economy. And, and you can tell me how you can do better, right? Because you could say that, well, you know, instead of uh, people storing apples, why don't we ask uh, uh, the young generation to give half of their apples to the older generation? So for example, uh, uh, 500 apples per person. Uh, so if there is a, the government or the, you know, that basically um, enforces to make sure that this is always happening. In that case, people will consume uh, 500 apples when young and 500 when old. And the total consumption will be higher in both periods, right? But, but in this case, it's like something like 400 and 300, it's less. So it's a, that's why there is inefficiency. And this is called dynamic inefficiency. So um, now what Samuelson did next um, in this model, and that was um, in, he published his paper in 1958, so that was a long time before, before Bitcoin, is that he introduced uh, money in, uh, in this model. And here, you know, for, the, for the sake of modern times, let's say that it's a cryptocurrency. Okay. So now suppose that in this economy, uh, well, people can store apples, but half of the apples spoil. But also, instead, they could uh, trade apples for Bitcoin. And in this example, the total supply of Bitcoin will be fixed. Okay? Um, and uh, Bitcoin is like, in this model, will be like Bitcoin. In, in practice, the total supply is fixed. Uh, it does not pay any dividends. It has zero cash flows. But later on, you could uh, sell your Bitcoin to somebody and get some sub apples in return. Okay? And so in this case, what will happen is, uh, well, if Bitcoin is going to have some value, then every single period is the same. Then it's going to have the same value in every single period. right? So that means that if you trade apples for Bitcoin, then uh, when you're young, then, then when you're old, you can um, trade your Bitcoins for Apple at exactly the same rate and get exactly the same number of Apples. Okay? So in that case, um, what is going to be um, R and uh, G with, uh, with Bitcoin? So let me um, uh, reset this poll. And uh, we are going to try this uh, one more time. The results are reset, and let me uh, start running it. Okay. So what are R and G with Bitcoin? And there are um, this, the the first one is A, but for some reason it shows as a as a bullet point. But the first one is A, B is zero and zero, and C is minus fifty percent and zero. 
So once I get to 200 votes, I'm going to start closing the poll. Okay, so I have 200. So going once, going twice, last chance, okay? And uh, most of you have answered B, and congratulations, B is the, the right answer. So the, the growth rate is still zero, uh, but with Bitcoin now the, re, the, the interest rate goes from minus 50% to zero. So it rises all the way to, to the G, GDP growth rate, okay? And uh, this is great. So now suddenly uh, we go from this inefficient outcome instead uh, what will happen is uh, the young people Instead of storing apples, they, uh, the old people have some Bitcoin, so they uh, sell some apples to the old people for Bitcoin, and then later when the young people become old for the same price, they can uh, uh, sell the Bitcoin and, and get the apples. Okay, and, uh, and as a result, um, the presence of this asset, which doesn't generate any cash flows in this economy, actually makes the outcome a lot more efficient, um, and uh, uh, the total consumption per person gets to be 1,000 instead of uh, 700, okay? And then uh, there is the second question of uh, how many apples can all Bitcoin buy? So I will just, you know, you, you, can, you can mentally answer this question, um, but I will tell you what the right answer is. So the right answer here is C. So uh, we have to know people's exact preferences to figure out exactly how many apples they will choose to uh, eat when they're young and how many apples people will choose to their old. Uh, some people could be uh, more impatient. Some people could be more patient. Well, it depends. It could be that people, different people have different preferences. That's okay. Well, ultimately, we don't know. Okay. So... Um, Sam, Paul Samuelson, he got a Nobel Prize for this model, and uh, uh, sometimes PhD students, they come up to me, and you know, I, I advise some PhD students, and they ask me, well, what's a good model? And very often people think that, well, a good model is a very complete and realistic model of the world, right? And um, the, the truth is, um, so, yes, it's good to have a realistic model. However, ultimately, what is a good model? A good model is ultimately a simple model that can generate a lot of insights. Okay, so that's ultimately uh, what we want. And if you want to make it more realistic later, for the purposes of, for example, you know, central banks of the world have you know, very realistic models that put in a lot of data to try to forecast you know, unemployment, how monetary policy affects unemployment, we can, right? So, but for now, uh, keeping things simple, let me use this model, so this is a great model, and change it a little bit to think about Bitcoin mining. So now, okay, Bitcoin mining in the Samuelson model. So now suppose that I'm going to change the model a little bit again. And instead of the total supply of Bitcoin being fixed, now the supply of Bitcoin can grow. Because some people can become programmers who can mine a uh, new Bitcoin. And uh, uh, out of a thousand young people, uh, 90 become programmers. <coughs> um, who mine Bitcoin, and together they increase the Bitcoin base by 25% a year, okay? So the number of Bitcoin grows by uh, 25%, and that means that if uh, one Bitcoin, okay, so that means uh, if uh, four Bitcoins bought five apples today, that means in the next period, there will be these four Bitcoins plus one more Bitcoin will be mined, a total of five Bitcoins. For every four Bitcoins that was before, 
and and four bitcoins become five bitcoins, and they will still buy five apples. Okay. So therefore, what is R in this case is that well, if you uh, invest in uh, four uh, bitcoins, and if you could uh, uh, buy five apples for the bitcoin before, that means that as a result to, of mining, now uh, the same investment gives you four apples, so 20% less. And so R in this case is minus 20, okay? So it's a little bit confusing because the growth rate of a Bitcoin base is 25% because five is 25% bigger than four, but you know, that's the way how math works out. R is minus 20%, okay? So if some people go into mining, then let's think what happens. So um, the total GDP will go down, right? Because uh, instead of uh, going to pick apples, these 90 programmers, they will mine Bitcoin, okay? So um, the GDP will go down, but um, I mean, unless you count the mined coins as GDP, which you know economists could, right? So, um, but are people better off with Bitcoin mining or without, and are they better off with Bitcoin or without? So, are people better off with uh, uh, with Bitcoin or without? And uh, the answer to this question is without Bitcoin altogether, R was minus 50%. And now R is minus 20%. So people can save at a, at a better rate with Bitcoin mining than without Bitcoin altogether. So with mining, people are better off than without Bitcoin. But they would rather prefer ultimately to have a stable price of a Bitcoin rather than to have these people who are mining. So... Uh, mining in that case uh, is uh, is inefficient in this in this model, okay. And um, as I was writing the slides, something I had thought about is uh, um, when I was growing up, I liked uh, puzzles, <coughs> and I still do. And some of you may be, you know, may also like puzzles. So here's the challenge question, and uh, uh, if you email me the answer. Uh, you know, sometime later today, if you figure it out, you can email me and I can tell you, you know, if, if your answer is correct or, or not correct, okay? So the challenge question, and the, the, this question is really not important for this talk, but, okay, so the challenge question is, uh, given this information, how many apples do people consume when they're young, and how many apples do people consume when they're old, okay? And uh, the key is 90 people choose to become programmers, and the Bitcoin base grows by 25% a year, okay? So anyways, now um, let me take the same model and change it a little bit more because um, what people use as money in this model could also be um, a currency issued by the government. So people could use, for example, pesos, okay? Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep all the numbers, well, almost all the numbers, the same, but I'm going to draw a slightly uh, different conclusion. So just as in the previous example, the government prints pesos and collects uh, seniorage, so money supply grows by 25% a year. So therefore, R is minus 20%, okay? And suppose people eat uh, 500 apples when young, say 500, and eat 20% uh, 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 less than what they saved, because R is minus 20%, 400 when old, okay? And uh, what is the government spending? Well, um, the, uh, the total consumption is 900, and uh, the total output uh, per young person is uh, 1,000, so it becomes 100 government spending that the, goes to the government per, per one person, so that's the government spending, okay? And now, um, let's do an interesting exercise. So let me use this information to try to value uh, uh, pesos in this uh, case. And ultimately, we can think about money as, well, this is the government's obligation backed by all of the uh, wealth of the, of the government, so backed by all of the future bar budget uh, surpluses. <laughs> 
And in this case, it's, um, it's actually going to be not budget surpluses, but there's, the government is running a deficit, so it's uh, printing money and spending in, in every single period. Okay, so there's going to be a deficit. And the question is, well, is the present value of these deficits equal to the uh, value of all pesos outstanding? And the question we are going to ask also is, what is, in this example, the value of all pesos? Okay, because ultimately, uh, what you see on some bills is, it says, we'll pay the bearer on demand. So ultimately, it's the government obligation. Okay, so... The value of government obligations, and we are going to use here the valuation formula in the context of uh, all of the government debt. And I have to say that this is a little bit unusual, uh, what I'm going to do next, because usually when people value bonds, then they value a single bond. Okay, so they would value uh, the, the coupons on the bond plus the principal repayment, they would figure out what discount rate they should use uh, taking the discount rate from the yield curve, and that's what uh, people would do, okay? Um, and that is similar to the dividend discount model. Um, for stocks, there's also the total payout model, which values total payouts to all uh, shareholders of the company in the form of dividend payments and share repurchases. And here we are doing like a total payout model in the context of the total government debt. So we are valuing total government debt um, using all of the future uh, budget surpluses and budget uh, deficits. And in this case, there is going to be a deficit every single period because that's the government spending financed by um, issuance of pesos. So that's uh, cash flows. It's a negative number. This is R minus 20%. And this is G is zero, and then if we calculate this, we get a, a positive number, and negative divided by negative is a positive number, okay? And do you think this, this answer is correct? Is that, well, let's, let's think about it. So in this example, people will, each person will use half of their apples to save for the old age, so they will buy pesos. So each person spends 500 to buy pesos, there are 1,000 people, so the value of all pesos is how much all of these people spend all together to buy pesos, and that's exactly uh, half a million apples. So uh, half of the apples are used to, to buy pesos. So this answer is actually correct. And like, if you look at it, well, this is actually correct, but this is, this is totally crazy, because you know, the, the cash flows are negative. And uh, this is ultimately correct, not because we think that these negative cash flows have a positive value in the future, but rather it's a consistency condition that if we have uh, uh, this growth rate, if we have uh, this discount rate, and if we have this cash flow, then what value is consistent with uh, those numbers? If there is some value, well, that's the value that's, that's consistent, okay? Because you know, so if you go from period to period, the value stays the same. Well, what value is consistent given the growth rate of the economy is zero? That's the value that's consistent. So that's why it's, it's correct, okay? But you can see that um, in the case when R is less than G, this is a super tricky case. And in fact, an, an asset with uh, negative cash flows could have a positive value, and, okay? And so it, it is theoretically possible for the government to run deficit forever if the required return in currency is less than the uh, growth rate of uh, the economy. And if you look, for example, at the actual data from, from Japan, you know, for the past, you know, uh, 20 years, then the growth rate of the Japanese economy is fluctuating and uh, the risk-free rate is, the real risk-free rate is fluctuating and uh, mostly, actually, R is less than G. So, um, in, in that case, so, okay. So, um, at this point, you can tell me is that, well, okay, so the um, Samuelson model is nice. However, um, it's, it's, a, it's a simplified model, so it's not a, completely realistic model, so you can tell me, well, the real world is really different, right? And so, um, in order to answer that, 
well, we cannot put everything that's out there in the world into a model. At least, you know, I cannot do for, for, for this talk. However, um, I can give a list of reasons, you know, why um, in, the, in practice there could be R less than G. So a list of theoretical reasons that, uh, you know, economists uh, give. Okay? And ultimately, this happens because of uh, frictions. So economists, they like talking about frictionless markets, okay? When uh, any investor can invest in anything out there in the economy, right? So that means that, you know, you could invest in, in anything and, uh, and be a completely passive investor. You can invest in real estate, you can invest in a startup. Well, that's not really possible, right? So um, there are various frictions in practice. So overlapping generations is one friction that comes out of Samuelson model and the that people want to save for retirement. Then uh, there are various types of financial frictions. So in fact, uh, issuing securities is a difficult process. So a company has to you know, mature sufficiently to uh, get to an IPO stage. And after IPO, it becomes a public company. And then there are all of the various regulations in place. In place, you have to satisfy certain accounting requirements. You have to fill out uh, quarterly uh, financial reports, and so on and so forth. So there is a burden to being public. So there are various uh, financial frictions. Um, so then um, there is idiosyncratic risk. So um, people have extra demand uh, for assets to, to invest in because, um, you know, they're worried about various risks that they, that they may face and they may want to save for precautionary motive. And then finally, well, you know, so in, a, in an idealized world, this growth rate of GDP, you could invest in the whole economy. But in practice, well, there are many parts of the economy that you cannot invest in. So some of the assets are not liquid then uh, there are some disruptive companies that, that basically uh, can get profit, but they're not even public yet. But they capture a large, large portion of the market, like you know, Uber before Uber was public, and so on and so forth. So how do you invest in those sources of growth? Is, uh, well, I guess if you go into venture capital, you can invest in, in venture capital. You know, then then that's 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 great, but otherwise, you know, that's hard. And then many of the assets, such as real estate, they require work. So there are various frictions in practice. Okay. Now, if um, R is less than G, then uh, um, this has implications for money and bubbles. Um, and what does it ultimately mean? Is that well. I was talking earlier about the supply and demand relationship in all markets. And in financial markets, R is less than G means that there is a demand for assets to save in. Okay. And this uh, extra demand, and if there are no assets to satisfy this demand, and why this excess demand could arise? Well, because of frictions. So this excess demand, it could uh, you know, fuel the value of Bitcoin. It can... Uh, inflate some bubbles. Um, it could um, uh, make it for um, governments easier to borrow and to have a, a larger debt. So that's uh, what could happen. And the interesting thing is, well, this uh, very basic theory, this perspective, it does not really distinguish between uh, money and bubbles. Um, and economists, for, for a long time, they have traditionally thought about money in bubbles very, very differently. Because, you know, we as people think about very, them very differently. Because money is something that's supposed to have a very stable value. It's the, what you use for payments. And bubbles, we think about them as completely irrational. But uh, recently, if you look at Bitcoin, well, it's kind of both. It's kind of both. A bubble. Well, we, we don't know if it's going to pop eventually or not. A lot of people think that it, it will grow in value and it will reach a certain mature stage at which the value of all Bitcoin is going to be a certain fraction of total economy, maybe. Um, 
but ultimately it, it blurs the line. So that's, that's very interesting between money and uh, bubbles. Okay. Um, I'll make one comment about efficient markets. Okay. So um, in efficient markets, you cannot have that. That R is uh, uh, less than G. You can only have that R is greater than G. Okay. And efficient markets are important for, uh, for any textbook. And uh, very often, economists, they believe in efficient markets. So they believe that, well, R is going to be greater than G. And these assets with uh, zero or negative cash flows, because of that, they, they should not have value. Okay. So even for people who think that, well, how confident are you? Suppose that you're 95% confident that this is the case. If there is a lot of uncertainty, maybe you say, OK, there is 5% of uncertainty that that's not the case. So then, if you're not 100% confident, but if you're only 95% confident, it means that if you're a believer in efficient markets, but you're only 95% confident, then your value of Bitcoin should be 95% times 0 plus 5% times a positive value. And guess what? it's going to be a positive number. So, uh, you know, so unless you're uh, completely certain, it's going to be a, a positive number, okay? So that's, that's interesting. Um, and uh, uh, assets with negative cash flows and arbitrage, um, you, you see a lot of things on this slide, but ultimately you may ask the question, well, isn't it arbitrage if you have an an asset with negative cash flows? And the answer is, well, it's only arbitrage in infinite horizon, but any finite horizon is not going to be arbitrage because if you sell something short, which has negative cash flows, you're going to receive some positive cash flows. Then when you have to cover, well, it could have grown. So you, if you cannot bet against uh, an asset like this, right? So, so ultimately, it could be an infinite horizon arbitrage if you could sell short a Bitcoin uh, or any asset with negative cash flows forever, in that case, you will sell it short and generate some cash. And then later on, uh, the negative cash flows from the asset are positive cash flows to you. But um, unless you, but if you have to eventually cover your position or may have to cover your position, then that's not really arbitrage. Okay. And then a really big question is. Um, if various assets um, with negative cash flows could have a positive value, then which asset is it going to be? So competition between bubble assets is actually a big question, and uh, theory tells us very little. And here in front of such a big audience, you know, I don't want to make any uh, you know, uh, crazy conjectures, but I'm happy to talk you know, in private about this question, but this is ultimately a big, uh, big, big question. So um, let me um, conclude. Um, and then if there are any questions from the audience, I'm happy to take them. But what I'm going to do is just give a brief uh, overview of how this talk went um, and how to tie everything together. So I have talked about the basic valuation formula and used an example of Coca-Cola to use it. Then the key input in that valuation formula is the required rate of return, the discount rate. And I have seen empirical papers that look at market fluctuations and they say that, well, 80% uh, of the change in value of the assets is explained by the change in that R, and only 20% is explained by the cash flow in use. So R is very important. Then I've talked about R and G in the Samuelson model. And uh, we can talk about uh, Bitcoin mining and uh, government budget deficits uh, in that model. And ultimately, the source of all of this is uh, economic frictions. Uh, because of economic frictions, you could have R less than G. And this fuels potential bubble assets. And the value of these bubble assets, they bring R closer to G, like we saw in the Samuelson model that uh, 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 R actually rises uh, towards G. So um, thank you very much. And
So looking at uh, the high inflation levels and um, budget deficits, uh, adopting. Oh, sorry. Oh. Sorry. So looking at high uh, levels of inflation. Looking at high levels of inflation and budget deficits, um, would adopting a new currency act as somewhat of a reset button for our government? Yes, yeah, so with high inflation levels and budget deficits, would adopting a new currency or a crypto, would that act as somewhat of a reset button? That's, that's a very interesting uh, question. So um, I grew up in Ukraine, um, and at, at some point, the government said that, well, we are going to, uh, 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 we, are, we are going to um, renumber the, the currency, right? Uh, and and, and uh, at that point, I guess they made the commitment that they're going to uh, keep uh, the, the stable value of the currency. Um, so the currency in, in, currently in circulation was taken out with a lot of zeros. A new currency was introduced, you know, without the zeros. And um, people at the moment were wondering whether this would be a successful move or not. But at that moment, it was really a successful move. And the inflation has basically stopped. Or at least it wasn't the same that at all uh, what it was during uh, during the hyperinflation period. Yeah. Um, do you think the NFTs are going to replace because of like X new big um, currency? That's, uh, that's a very good question. Um, so NFTs, they are for those of you who do not know. So NFTs is is a little bit of a this crazy phenomenon. Um, so these are uh, pieces of digital art uh, that you can freely copy, and you can have a copy on your computer, but there is only one uh, verified owner that's verified using uh, blockchain technology, right? And the interesting thing about Bitcoin is, uh, like money, um, it, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's divisible, right? So you could, you could uh, but uh, uh, NFTs, they're kind of like unique, right? And uh, the analog of that is, uh, uh, well, gold is, you know, money that's, uh, that's divisible. And uh, there is art. People invest in art. Um, and art, uh, physical art, this is, uh, uh, well, it also has, you know, uh, sort of like real value, because real sort of like significant uh, cultural value. But uh, in a way, it's, it's, it's a little bit uh, analogous to, to NFTs. So I would say that if your question is, well, will NFTs replace the cryptocurrency, then the answer is, well, definitely no, because uh, um, uh, one of them is uh, um, divisible, um, and the other, the other one is, you know, each unit has a unique value which is determined by completely separate market forces. So for example, NFTs would not be very good for, uh, for payments. I recently heard an interview with the new um, mayor of New York City mm -hmm. who said that he wants to get his first three paychecks with Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that might be a trend coming for the United States. Yeah, I see. If people would, uh, if Bitcoin would replace the, um, the dollar. So, I mean, it's an interesting statement, but... Uh, for the government, ultimately, um, you know, they want to have monetary policy, and they want to because because of the various reasons, you know, to stimulate the economy in times of uh, um, recession, uh, for example. And uh, with Bitcoin, you cannot conduct uh, monetary policy because you do not have uh, the full control of this currency. So, um, you know, maybe maybe he said it, but ultimately, uh, I think that. You know the ability to conduct monetary policy means a lot, and you cannot, uh, you know, uh, give that up. <laughs>
Could be, right? Could be, could be. So it's an interesting statement. I actually haven't heard it. I actually haven't heard it, so it's actually interesting that it's happened. Hi. Uh, you mentioned something about the theory. Uh, the question is, if we have a controlled environment mm -hmm. where we can run uh, and run some empirical experiments, mm -hmm. do you think that can help us in creating a theory, or it will be uh, hard to assume that? Um, so uh, I think that's, that's, that's a great idea. So there has been rise of, uh, I mean, there have been experiments done in psychology for a long time. So that's very much a tradition in psychology. In economics experiments, uh, you know, uh, there are people who are doing experimental economics, but that's a relatively recent phenomenon. But I think that, you know, I think if, if you want to design a, a study to, to study something like this in a lab uh, setting, I mean, I think that's a great research idea. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously, we have a little bit of inflation right now. Mm -hmm. um, do you think long term, whether it's from Bitcoin or currencies or from credit, do you think we'll have some kind of recession in the future? Uh, sorry, one more time, can you repeat? Um, so right now, obviously, have we're having a little bit of inflation. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, do you think in the long term, there could be a recession from either credit uh, or all these currencies? From from credit or from the from the currencies, OK. So that's, uh, uh, that, well, so okay, so um, if you look at the at the at the past history, then uh, it is true that uh, if there is a if some if an, if an asset uh, becomes inflated in value and that becomes a bubble, and when that bubble crashes, that that coincides with uh, with inflation. So. Um, uh, so the, there is that mechanism in play there because if you look at the housing bubble, you know that has caused the the, the great recession. If you look at the bubble uh, in the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties, uh, that has caused you know the Great Depression. Um, and uh, so 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 there is there is uh, that possibility theoretically. I mean, whether it's going to happen with Bitcoin or not, I cannot tell you. But uh, um, you know, but uh, uh, there is definitely an empirical an empirical link between bubbles and recessions, between bubbles popping and recessions. Hi, uh, I was wondering. Um, what you think will happen to the price of Bitcoin or any impact on the US dollar if Bitcoin market cap reaches that of the USD, uh, US dollar market cap? What this theory predicts that um, uh, the lecture was about is that when um, R is less than G, then there is certainly some competition uh, between uh, you know these assets that that fill the bubble, um, so the competition force uh, is there. Uh, big question is well, um, uh, you know which which of the assets uh, will uh, um, get the most value, and then you you have to look at the the fundamentals behind the asset and some of the factors to consider uh, like. For Bitcoin or against are um, the points that I have mentioned at the very at the very beginning of the talk. What proponents of Bitcoin uh, say and what people against the Bitcoin say. So, for example, the proponents they um, you know they uh, talk about the limited supply of Bitcoin, which is which is not the case for for the U.S. dollar. But on the other hand. Uh, Bitcoin is not the legal tender, and uh, uh, the U.S. dollar is the legal tender, and so the government has has a lot of uh, control there. So that obviously will have uh, uh, impact on the on the value. So um, uh, it's hard to imagine that Bitcoin would rise in value to to compete with the U.S. dollar, um, but we'll see. 
some people, a lot of people think that, well, I mean, it already has a, has a, it already has a lot of value, but it's not the same magnitude as the U.S. dollar for sure. I, I guess. Do you think that the U.S. dollar would be great at that point, or is it going to The the market advice I cannot maybe I cannot give you any market advice, but you know you can talk about uh, you know theory behind it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there is definitely a lot of interest, a lot of interest in that, but uh, the government would still want to control the monetary policy on the, on the cryptocurrency. So um, I guess, you know, if you have a country that's running hyperinflation and, you know, they need a commitment device to, to stop it, then, you know, they could adopt a, a cryptocurrency and that will, would, you know, tie, tie their hands. But uh, otherwise, um, you know, a country like the U.S. for sure would want to con have control over monetary policy. Thank you. Thank you, all, everyone, for your attendance. Uh, um, this concludes our uh, this year's uh, lecture. Uh, we hope to see you next year. So st please uh, st come back again. Thank you. Have a good evening. Mm -hmm. Thank you.